hello to everyone watching. My hope with all our studying is not only for those who are married to have better marriages, but also for those who are not married to think twice about their intended spouse, to look back at everything that we will read and have read, and really consider and compare that person to what God expects, and also to honestly judge ourselves whether we are married or not. Are we what God wants us to be? If I'm not what God wants me to be, should I even form a home, an Adventist home? May we be blessed as we continue our studying, and may you find something relevant for you as we read together. This is a very sensitive chapter, a very vague chapter, understandably, especially for those days, and given anyone who would read this book of any age, but I will not be as vague because things have changed, society has changed, things are worse now than they've ever been, if society has fallen in every aspect, obviously, this one, the bedroom, things have deteriorated there as well. Morality has declined since the beginning of time. And we always, we have a lot to learn as people who are married. What we think we know and what our experiences in the first one year, two years, is not going to be the same. After a while, when that first blush of romance and lust from the marriage, <laughs> combined with love, is gone. I'm going to be very open and I'm going to use very specific words, so just beware. I'm going to be as honest and as real as I can be and as forthright as I can be. Just to give you an example, I've been married a while when my friend who had been in my wedding also got married. So we gave them a wedding gift and we also included a bottle of lubricant sexual lubricant. Oh, I'm gonna have to use the word sexual because this is what this is about. And um, they thought, ah, please, after the honeymoon, please, we don't need it. Because during the honeymoon phase, just being with your beloved and seeing him is enough to make everything ready for intimacy. But later on, life went back. When life was normal again, and they did need a bit of help. But when they realized the bit they needed the help, they'd gotten rid of our gift. So they blushed when we visited them, when they got back, and they blushed and they confessed that we threw away your gift. We were thinking, oh please, we are not like other people. We will always be, or the woman, will always be physically ready for penetration. And it wasn't the case. And she, wa she wanted, you know, emotionally she was ready. She didn't need the prolonged foreplay. Yeah, these are words I don't say <laughs> normally. So, yeah. Um, so they went and got olive oil from the kitchen. And yeah, they said it was a mistake. So water-based lubricant helps because sometimes women do want to. They want to participate, but their bodies are not ready. Mothers especially are tired and strained and the mind is more about caring for the little ones it's very hard to switch off but you do also want to have that intimacy with your husband so many wives and especially during menopause and after lubricant safe healthy water-based lubricant is your friend so that you don't do anything that will hurt yourself and your husband friction hurts both of you. Right, so please learn from those who have been there longer than you, even if it's not going to be for you. Lay it aside. You might just need it one day. You never know. Jesus did not enforce celibacy. Chapter 18. No religion that God set up requires anybody to be a single person, to be a single man, to be a single woman. The Levites, the priests, were all allowed 
it was good that they have wives and be and have children. There was no priest who couldn't marry. There was no nun who had to stay a virgin. Virginity until old age. Celibacy was never God's plan. Um, he came not. So I'm reading the second paragraph. Jesus did not enforce celibacy upon any class of men. He came not to destroy the sacred relationship of marriage, but to exalt it and restore it to its original sanctity. He looks with pleasure upon the family relationship where sacred and unselfish love bears sway. We have alluded to a marriage bed that is holy, where the angels look with pleasure upon the couple that has is hallowing the marriage bed. There is a way to have sex that is not godly. There is a way to have sex that is God approved. There are orifices, openings, that were meant for certain things that have certain bacteria. God never meant for anything other than the bacteria to exit there. Maybe suppositories for sickness to enter in. But let's be honest. We know exactly what part is really, purely, safely what God would approve. And it's not only the homosexual men who make use of that orifice. Women do too. And that orifice, the anus, does not have any lubricant, natural. So even if the woman has been given the correct amount of foreplay, yes, we'll come into that too, it will not ever reach that hole because it's not meant for that activity. Let us think hard about what we are doing. It might seem boring to the world, but it's good and holy to God. And that's what we want. We want to live good and holy lives. If couples, Jonathan, no, not Jonathan, Zechariah and Elizabeth could live such lives and all the other patriarchs, so can we. When the sacred nature and the claims of marriage are understood, it will even now be approved of heaven, and the result will be happiness to both parties, and God will be glorified. Marriage is holy. Everything that takes place in the marriage should therefore also be holy, and when it is, God will look with pleasure on us. He doesn't ignore certain aspects. He doesn't say, all right, you were a good worker, you were a good cleaner. This one doesn't matter what you do in the bedroom. God has an interest in everything we do. And he wants to be pleased by us. He wants us to reach the highest standard of holiness, morality that is possible. It is carrying that which is lawful to excess that makes it a grievous sin. How will you know that something is excessive? One, if it's dominating your thoughts. I can't take my hands off this man. I can't take my hands off her all day long. That's excess. That is definitely carried to excess. Where's the time for your God? Where's the time to read and expand your mind? Where's the time to watch, I don't know, some documentary or the other, read the news? Excess can already be only already in the thoughts. Excess will be very clear when pain happens. There is a limit up to which after that, even if you both wanted it badly, the woman will feel pain that can last days. Then you will know you are excessive. Anything that harms, that injures the delicate organs, excessive. That, though, there are diseases like um, what is that one now? It's not polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's endometriosis. For many women, endometriosis, no matter how careful the husband is, it is painful inside there because of the fibers and all that have grown. I can't remember the scientific word for everything that just engulfs the inside and prevents, what's it called? And prevents 
um, and prevents fertilization and pregnancy. It is painful. Those men who I know who are godly, though they're not Seventh Day Adventist, they are not then expecting their wives to do things that are not godly just because they are not able to fulfill their marriage vows or to fulfill the way that because they're not married to have they're not able to have sex the way everyone else does. The man doesn't then say, "Fine, I will use the other entrance," as some men do. He just says, "We will kiss, and that will be fine." I will use my finger to make you happy and that will be fine. That is gentle and that is gentle and thoughtful. That's the other thing that is through the that runs through this. A man has to be thoughtful. We're talking about the man's animal passions and it is unfortunately we know. We might not want to admit it, some of us men, but men more than any more than the other sex are the ones who are led by passion are the ones whose bodies and lower members lower organs rule them more than the mind and the intellect and if it becomes excessive the animal passions not just general romance affection but animal passions there's a difference there's nothing i wanted to touch on sorry i'm jumping over here i had a reminder of a friend who she was saying that she believes that a wife should never initiate intercourse because then she's awakening his animal passions so i said okay but then if he initiates intercourse then are you saying intercourse itself is an animal passion what about the fact that god said you must not deprive each other you must have sex unless you've both agreed and then after a while you will have sex again marriage includes sex Everybody has sex who's married. God did never, never said to any couple, don't have sex. So, animal passions are not lovemaking and intercourse. Animal passions is when it's not ruled anymore by logic, thoughtfulness, foresight, kindness, and it's just about pleasure. Like when you see dogs rutting or rams or animals, donkeys, they don't care about the woman or the not the woman. They don't care about the female. They just want to be able to spread out their seed. That is when the animal passions have taken over. When the man doesn't care about the woman's pleasure, doesn't care about whether she's actually ready or not, and then hurts her. So I stand to be corrected by God. <laughs> But women initiating intercourse in a safe and holy way is not a sin. Please, if you think like her, just think twice and question yourself because then that would mean all intercourse is sin. It's what she leads him to do that would be the sin. Because yes, women also do things to men's back passages which they shouldn't be doing. And it goes both so it goes both ways. It goes both ways ways so don't okay i'll come to that part about don't wake him up so i'll go there let me just go there slowly but very few feel it to be a religious duty to govern their passions they have united themselves in marriage to the object of their choice and therefore reason that marriage sanctifies the indulgence of the baser passions even men and women professing godliness give loose rein to their lustful passions and have no thought that God holds them accountable for the expenditure of vital energy which weakens their hold on life and enervates the entire system. I'm going to have to be open a, a crass, but okay. Recently in the UK, a woman passed out, she had been drunk and she fell asleep on a bench. An immigrant into the UK found her, a man. Instead of covering her with a blanket, instead of waking her and asking her, where do you live? He proceeded to rape her orally. He gave her so many orgasms that she died. Orgasms are good. Too many orgasms, not good. They are dangerous. 
to kill someone because she had too many orgasms it's bad and there comes a point when a woman is too aroused and it becomes uncomfortable that's where the man also needs to stop and think about the impact that he's having because there are some men who want to prove their virility and prove that I'm really good at love making I want to make you I want to make you orgasm and for them it's not about the connection it's about see I made you orgasm three times four times did you see that that also is excessive it is excessive it's about community <laughs> community it's about coming together and being one united in flesh and in mind it's not about a show of I can do it better it's not about that it's about showing your wife that you love her it's about solidifying your relationship as a husband and wife it's not about the number of orgasms it's not about constantly stimulating the that sensitive part because when overstimulated that sensitive part of the woman that has a hood it becomes uncomfortable and painful too there is a way that is excessive there are things that people do that are excessive and if you find that your intercourse or your foreplay men is leading her to say stop please just stop now you've gone too far step back and continue foreplay doesn't have to last three four hours it really doesn't um god holds you accountable she doesn't need to have lost all her strength and energy through multiple orgasms she has to do other things with that very precious body of hers temperance temperance in everything temperance in the bedroom let the christian wife <coughs> sorry let the christian wife refrain both in word and act from exciting the animal passions of her husband many have no strength at all to waste in this direction from the youth up they have weakened the brain and sapped the constitution by the gratification of animal passions self denial and temperance should be the watchword in their married life pornography temperance from a young age already sapped weakened brains pornography is evil for many reasons one it degrades the actual sexual act one it gives young boys a totally wrong idea of what intimacy should be like three it excites and innervates nerves that should not be excited nor innervated a man who orgasms too much he ends up losing zinc and I will check that and I'll tell you if I'm wrong but you end up losing nutrients don't don't do porn don't watch porn even with your wife don't your marriage life the only naked person you should be looking at is your wife and not because she's an object to put your animal I don't know animal passion, passions upon an animal as i said before doesn't care how the other feels that's how it was for that woman i mentioned before who he would just want her to be ready and to engage not that he wanted her to be ready so that there's no pain he wanted her to be ready to perform too many men say i am the head we are married you owe me there's a lot of marital rape going on even today there are a lot of women who are scared to say no even when they are sick or unwell because of fear fear oh he'll cheat on me if he's going to cheat on you because you said no two nights of the week he's got the problem not you and because they feel that the bible says you must but it says no just agree tonight i don't feel like it i'm really tired and i'm really stressed or i'm really upset or i'm really in emotional pain just you know physical pain some men rush even after giving the wife has given birth men that is an animal passion 
If you love your wife, you'll be tender. You will keep her health foremost in your mind and you'll make sure that she's ready and you will be gentle. But okay, back to the women now. As I said, as I said, there are things women do that are not meant to be done. There are ways that a woman will make him feel like she's just an object to be played with. And then he too will react in the same way. Okay, you just want it. Okay. And that will weaken his respect for her. She wants to be my plaything. She wants me to use her in any way. There'll be suggestions she gives that you know are not godly. Say no. Let the Christian... Oh. It is not pure love which actuates a man to make his wife an instrument to minister to his lust. It is the animal passions which clamor for indulgence. So that is, again, what it defines or describes what I'm trying to say. When you want intercourse with your wife to show her you love her, it's not the same as she must minister to my lust. She must be the receptacle of my semen. That's animal passion. How few men show their love in the manner specified by the Apostle, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, that it should be holy and without blemish. This is the quality of love in the marriage relation which God recognizes as holy. Love is a pure and holy principle, but lustful passion will not admit of restraint and will not be dictated to or controlled by reason. It is blind to consequences. It will not reason from cause to effect. There are different causes, there are different effects that result from a man who just uses his, a woman as a receptacle for his semen as opposed to a partner who's meant to feel loved who's meant to receive his attention who is who he is meant to provide foreplay to i'll come back to foreplay i hope i remember but when he doesn't want to listen if you say i'm in pain if he doesn't want to listen when you say i'm not well if he wants to sulk when you say, I'm really not okay today, that's because his animal passions are ruling him. He's not controlled by reason. He's not controlled by love for you. He doesn't care whether you're uncomfortable or not. The man who still wants to have intercourse with you, even though you've got a yeast infection, even though you've got thrush, which he, men actually can get thrush and pass it back onto you, that man is not controlled by reason. Nobody has died by missing a few days or weeks, depending if you've just if you've given birth or had some other operation. Nobody has died from not having sex for six weeks or eight weeks or whatever it is. Nobody has died from not having sex should situations not allow it anymore. For me, as someone who's got ankylosing spondylitis, it is a big problem for us as well. It's not only the endometriosis people. I'm sure that I know that there, there must be others as well who cannot perform. The people in wheelchair who are numb from the bottom down, clitoral stimulation will do nothing for them. And if you've got ankylosing spondylitis like me, your hips don't work very well. All of those things the men should take into consideration. And if they are godly, they'll make sure that they make sure you are comfortable as well. Consequences, as I said, there are many consequences. Okay, I can I'll mention two. One is the physical pain. They, there can even be a discharge from when you frictioned, rubbed, and made sores on the inside of that woman. So there's pain, there's injury, and there's the emotional toll of feeling like you're just your husband's plaything. That all he wants is just you're just a living blow up doll. He's not seeing you as someone who deserves to be loved, 
to receive love, but he just sees you as someone who he has to inflict his sex upon, his lust upon. And there's some women, probably many, who feel like, I'm just a prostitute. I'm just a prostitute. There's no affection. That is a very serious consequence. There is something harmful that you're doing to your wife and you're breaking down the marriage completely. If she doesn't feel loved and respected in the bed, then she'll never feel loved and respected in any other sphere either. Sexual excess will effectually destroy a love for devotional exercises, will take from the brain the substance needed to nourish the system, and will most effectively exhaust the vitality. Have you ever heard of people who are just too tired after sex? Now imagine being too tired multiple times a day. Energy gone. No woman should aid her husband in this work of self-destruction. She will not do it if she is enlightened and has true love for him. Unfortunately, there are women who are enlightened, but the men are abusive. So, we can't blame all women. This one, the abuse part, the rapists, we will blame on the husbands. Husbands can and do rape their wives. No means no. Husbands should be careful, attentive, constant, faithful, and compassionate. They should manifest love and sympathy. If they fulfill the words of Christ, their love will not be of a base, earthly, sensual character that will lead to the destruction of their own bodies and bring upon their wives debility and disease. They will not indulge in the gratification of base passions while ringing in the ears of their wives that they must be subject to the husband in everything. When the husband has the nobility of when the husband has the nobility of character, purity of heart, elevation of mind that every true Christian must possess, it will be made manifest in the marriage relation. If he has the mind of Christ, he will not be a destroyer of the body but will be full of tender love, seeking to reach the highest standard in Christ. This echoes other things we have spoken about when you've studied this book. A bad husband is a bad Christian. An unkind husband is an unholy Christian. If he's not a good priest in the home, he shouldn't be a priest in the church. And if he's not kind, compassionate and faithful, he shouldn't even be touching you in the bed at all. He needs to be all of these things. Then he will have tender love, seeking to reach the highest standard in Christ. I have a friend who said they used to pray before they have intercourse. They stopped because that just changes things. But it's a good mindset to have, to pray before you do it. Um, and then you remember, God is watching you. It's a good idea. I will not knock anyone who does that. It is a good idea to submit your bodies first to God before you submit them to each other. I'm not saying do it. I don't pray myself, but it's a good idea. It is a good idea, especially if you know that you are tempted to only think about yourself. Because here, the other thing is, most of the time, men are easily aroused. And because they are aroused, they want to then take action. And I know I said it before. Foreplay is not just 20 minutes in bed. When she's tired and lying down and thinking, I can rest. Then you're like, oh, I want to take off your whatever. I want to have sex with you. That's not foreplay. Foreplay is having ensured that you have been thoughtful throughout the hours you've been together that you've lightened her burden throughout the hours that you've been together, that you've loved her selflessly like Christ loved the church throughout the day, throughout the hours you've spent with each other so that she feels the love. And when with her heart and the mind she feels the love, her body will then naturally follow.
The matter now to be settled is, shall the wife feel bound? Shall the wife feel bound to yield implicitly to the demands of her husband when she sees that nothing but base passions control him, and when her reason and judgment are convinced that she does it to the injury of her body, which God has enjoined upon her to possess in sanctification and honor, to preserve as a living sacrifice to God? Shall she found? Shall she feel bound to do that? Obviously, we know it is not so. If she possesses true love and wisdom, she will seek to divert his mind from the gratification of lustful passions to high and spiritual themes by dwelling upon interesting spiritual subjects. It may be necessary to humbly and affectionately urge even at the risk of his displeasure, that she cannot debase her body by yielding to sexual ex excess. Do it in a humble way. Don't snap. Don't curse him, but be godly and say no. <coughs> <coughs> you owe it to God. Your body belongs to God. He created you. When the wife yields her body and mind to the control of her husband, being passive to his will in all things, sacrificing her conscience, her dignity, and even her identity, she loses the opportunity to she loses the opportunity of exerting that mighty influence for good which she should possess to elevate her husband. Women again we are reminded our jobs are to elevate our husbands. They might not want to always be elevated. They might resist. They might come down and heap a torrent of terrible words upon you. Or they might mock you. But our job still remains to elevate our husbands. If we allow them to do anything they want, when we want, allow them to have too much sex, too long, too often, we are not doing them any favors. We're not in. We're not elevating them. We're not ennobling them. Our Christian duty is spread out throughout our entire married life and through the different spheres and aspects of our married life. God wants us to be a good example. God wants us to be a good influence, even in that part. And saying no doesn't make you an unsubmissive wife. It makes you submissive to God. And that is what God wants. If the wife feels that in order to please her husband, she must come down to his standard when animal passion is the principal basis of his love and controls his actions, she displeases God, for she fails to exert a sanctifying influence upon her husband. If she feels that she must submit to his animal passions without a word of remonstrance, she does not understand her duty to him, nor to her God. I will end there. Our bodies were created by God to honor him, to be a fit temple ready for his Holy Spirit to inhabit. The marriage bed can be holy if everything is done correctly, if the correct passages of the body are used, if nothing is done to excess. And if at the forefront of the husband's mind, because that's the biggest focus of this chapter, if the forefront, if at the forefront of his mind was, is my wife ready? Is my wife pleased? Is my wife in a good mood? Is my wife interested in intercourse right now anyway? Then you're on the path, on the right path. We need all those things. We need to submit up to God. We need to, as men, understand that our wives owe God first. We are not the owners of our wives' bodies. God is. I pray for all the people who have been hurt by husbands who have been cruel, husbands who have been unkind, husbands who have treated the women as if they are depriving them when they don't submit to the lower, the base animal passions. There's nothing wrong with you at all. He is the one with the problem. If he wants to come and try things that you know are ungodly, he is the one who has the problem. 
he needs to repent and go back to God, not you. You don't owe him anything except to give what God requires you to give. And that is for us to not deny each other the holy love making except by agreement and then to quickly come back together when possible health disability sickness that's another story for another day may god bless us all everything is important to god